Hello, everyone. I am excited to welcome you all here today. My name is Kimberly Long, and I'm the events manager at the Institute on the Environment within the University of Minnesota. Special thanks to the Georgia Strait Alliance and the Salish Sea Institute at Western Washington University for co-sponsoring today's event. This event will kick off with an introduction by our moderator before a short musical performance. Our panel will have about 45 minutes to answer your questions, and we've already gotten a few great ones to start us out with. If you have a question for the panelists, please send it through the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Jenny Broadhurst, the director of the Salish Sea Institute at Washington, Western Washington University. Jenny. Thank you, Kimberly, and welcome to everyone who's participating today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to moderate this panel. I'm speaking to you from my home in Bellingham, Washington. Bellingham is on the ancestral homelands of the Lummi Nation and the Nooksack tribe, and I'm grateful for their long stewardship of the lands. Since we have a very geographically dispersed audience today, um, welcome all you Minnesotans to um, this, this talk. We have a mix of, of uh, folks from Minnesota and Washington and elsewhere. Um, I want to first um, ground us in where we are. And um, Kimberly, if you could put up that map of the Salish Sea, that would be great. So this beautiful map was created by cartographer Stefan Freeland at Western Washington University. It shows this international ecosystem that's called the Salish Sea. It um, includes the Strait of Georgia and British Columbia, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, um, that sort of uh, has an international border running right between it and Puget Sound. So it's, uh, it's an area that's a rich ecosystem and has a complex management, international management strategy um, with two countries, a province, a state, and over 60 tribes and First Nations that live here. And if you could bring up the, the next map. This is a little more uh, traditional type of map that we see uh, from Google. And um, I wanted to just emphasize this, this area that's kind of right in the heart of the Salish Sea and is where the southern resident killer whales often are seen um, and, and that's featured in the, in the film. And also, um, you'll see that line uh, that runs right between the San Juan Islands and the Gulf Islands. And that is the international border. And it also happens to be the shipping channel for, for traffic that comes, comes in from the Pacific Ocean into the inland waters. Okay, so that's just the, the quick um, geographic scoping here. And um, I'm going to keep us moving. Mark Peddleti from the Institute on the Environment at University of Minnesota directed the film that's the focus of today's panel discussion, Sentinels of Silence, Whale Watching, Noise, and the Orca. Mark, could you just briefly share why you made this film? Sure, and I, I really want to start by thanking you, Jenny, and the Salish Sea Institute, and Kimberly, and the whole team at the Institute on the Environment and George Strait Alliance for sponsoring and hosting this event. Um, it was really three things, and I'll go through them very quickly, that brought me to this film. The first one was observation. I've been married to a wonderful woman from this area for 32 years, and so for about 34 years I've been coming here, living here for part of that, and certainly observing. Um, and one of the things that I have noticed has comes out in the film is that the flotilla, the whale watching flotilla and industries is increased over that time. And as far as the Southern resident killer whales, I've been able to see that, that it's, it's the, the number of boats that are around them has increased and um, as the numbers decline and certainly not saying that's the cause. Uh, for example, at Eagle Lake where we owned a cabin, I had a sort of first row seat often when the whales would come around this edge, which they don't do as, as much as San Juan, but, and seeing how they behaved and by the behave, I mean all boaters, not just whale watchers. And kayaking there at one point was particularly influential. And I really don't know when that was. I think it was like 2013, 2014. And um, the whales came to me and as a responsible you know, kayaker, I got off to the side to, to give them space. 
and it's just saw them sort of surrounded and and the loud you know bullhorns announcing what they're doing and the, the clapping as they breach etc and it felt a little bit like sea world and it got me curious about really what that means and it also makes me happy because fish and wildlife are not there that day and as i see these proposals to increase the um fish and wildlife's ability to be our sentinels and monitor, et cetera, and, and new tech, use new, new technologies like geotagging. I think that's hopeful, but that's just anecdotal observation. Really, my, my stronger interest has to do with um, knowledge of sound and knowing how it behaves and the acoustics and then reading the bioacoustics literature. Um, I am not a bioacoustician by any means. I'm an anthropologist by PhD, uh, but reading that as sort of a literate reader of acoustics, um, I was really interested in what's potentially a disjuncture between the way we behave with the whales and what we know about sound. The recent Washington Academy um, report that collates and synthesizes that the bioacoustics research is very good, especially as it is, relates to the local research done. Um, I also want to draw people's attention to the global research, such as recently, and this didn't make it into the film, but uh, de Klerk et al.'s work in Iceland, for example, that goes beyond amplitude and frequency and some of the simpler modeling and simpler measurement in a more sophisticated analysis. And so I'm really fascinated by that field, and I think we have a lot to learn from it, especially when we apply it to policy. And um, I believe it warrants the precautionary principle. Um, the final thing that, that brought me to this uh, was that I met some scientists who, reasonably so, um, as we talk about the Chinook, the dams, and the toxins being so important, but as we round that out ecologically, thinking about the entire system and therefore acoustics, some of those that work with acoustics were somewhat afraid to talk. And I soon found out why that is, that many people that have mentioned acoustics has been somewhat of a taboo topic. Um, and I thought this film should tell that story of the slap lawsuits and the lobbyists, et cetera. And those stories needed to be told along with the industry point of view, which is why I dedicated five minutes of this very short documentary to um, Jeff Friedman, who I'm a fan of. I think his representation of the Pacific Whale Watch Association is um, excellent in the film. I think he does a good job of representing that point of view. And it makes me sort of hopeful that there could be a win-win where truly responsible whale, wa whale watchers would be able to have um, sort of preferential access and recognizing that a very small part percentage of their, their whale watching activities are now the Southern resident killer whales. So that was sort of it. The, Sol the Salish elders tell us that these are our relatives and we idolize them and everything from hotel names to souvenirs. And I hope we um, can learn to take care of our family a little bit better in that regard. And that's what this film is really about and this panel. So I, I look forward to hearing what people have to say. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, well, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dana Lyons, who is really um, a, a local musical hero to me. Um, Dana is also in Bellingham, uh, I think not too far from where I'm at. And um, many of his fans got to know him from uh, his song, Cows with Guns, which is a fun one. Um, but today he's gonna play the Great Sailor Sea. So thanks so much for being with us, Dana. And I'm going to put myself uh, off screen while you do that. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> well, pleasure to be here today. Uh, the song, The Great Salish Sea, is written from the point of view of one of the orcas. And I wrote this uh, kind of from Granny's point of view. Granny uh, was the matriarch of the southern resident orcas, the orcas that live here in the Salish Sea. And she passed on, I don't know, three, four, five years ago. She was around 103, 104 years old. And this song kind of, I'm imagining what kind of boat sounds she was hearing over the course of the century when she lived. Um, we think she was born oh, around 1910 and then um, maybe lived till, well, lived till 2015, 2016 in there. So you can imagine the song talks about the sounds of the uh, dugout cedar canoes of the Native Americans and then the great sailing ships showing up and then you know the giant ships that pass through the Salish Sea today. <clears throat> Excuse me. We will swim a thousand miles to reach the shores of emerald 
reptiles with salmon spawning by the million herring spawning by the billion gather with our pods again the summer food the summer friends to raise our babies safe and free we gather in the salish sea oh hush hear the swish of the boats on the water the hot load out cedars the sons and the daughters the rhythm of paddles caressing the water the rhythm of paddles to come greet the orca remember the legend the myth and the story a long time ago when we witnessed the glory with thousands and thousands of whales swimming free the orcas come home to the great salish sea oh I hear your song for many miles, your distant thoughts, your distant smiles. Today we fish in different bays. Tonight we meet again to play. Oh, hush. Hear the swish of the boats on the water, the great sailing ships with the sons and the daughters, the wind and the wood as it cuts through the water, the wind and the wood sailing out to the orca. Remember the legend, the myth. Then the story a long time ago when we witnessed the glory of thousands and thousands of whales swimming free. The orcas come home to the great sailor sea. Oh. One hundred times around the sun I saw the slaughter, smelled the blood The water turning blue to brown The metal ships, the screaming sound I cannot hear your song today the salmon gone, the herring late, and more and more the ships do come. Will anybody hear my song? Oh, hush. Hear the scream of the ships on the water, the great super tankers, the coal ports, the freighters, the deafening noise overtaking the water, the deafening noise overcoming the orca. Remember the legend, the myth. Then the story a long time ago when we witnessed the glory with thousands and thousands of whales swimming free. And the orcas come home to the great Salish Sea. Oh, hush. Hear the voice from both sides of the border, the rallies, the blockades, the brave sons and daughters, the people speak out for protecting the water, the people are rising to come save the orca. Thank you. That was beautiful. 
Thank you, Jenny. Just a lovely way for us to kick this off. Thanks so much for being here. And I'm so grieving that we're not in person because I would then be able to uh, buy a CD and get you to <laughs> sign it and get my picture taken with you. <laughs> All the fun things that we can't do right now, but we'll get there. We'll, we'll get we'll, there. We'll, we'll do our best. We'll do our best in the meantime. And things like this where we're educating each other how to protect the orcas is... It's what we can do. It's the era we're in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for helping us All make right. the best of it. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Thank you, everyone. And I think Dana might be hanging out in the background while we bring while we have this panel discussion. But um, it's my turn now to introduce our panelists. Um, and first up is uh, Donna Sandstrom, who's founder and executive director of the Whale Trail. Um, and Donna was a member of the governor's uh, Washington Orca Task Force. We also have Dr. Tim Reagan, who's the former executive director of the Marine Mammal Commission. We have Sorrel North, who's community organizer uh, for Southern Resident Protection. And last but not least, Dr. Christopher Clark, who's a graduate professor at Cornell University and founding director of the Bioacoustics Research Program. So welcome to all of you. For those who are um, listening in, um, the Q&A box is active and um, Kimberly is keeping track of questions that come in. We had a few that were already submitted when people registered. And so I've looked at some of those and I'm going to start us with just kind of a general question about the health of the current population of the southern resident killer whales. We, they're at 74. We had just harrowing um, experience last year with Tahlequah carrying her, her dead uh, infant orca for so many days. Um, but we also know that there's a couple new baby orcas. And so help us understand, you know, How's this population doing? Um, how are we feeling about the, just the overall health of the population? Um, and maybe that, Tim, is that, uh, can I address that one to you for starters? Sure, I'm glad to answer that. 74 is a number just slightly more than there were back in the early 1970s. Uh, it represents a decline from about 98 in 1995, which was not a fully recovered population at that time because of things that humans had done to these killer whales before that. The number 74 tells the picture generally, but I'm a demographer and as a demographer, you wanna look more closely at what that, or what that population is composed of. And for me, the big thing is right now we have 22 females that are capable of reproduction. So in lots of ways, uh, well, in every way, uh, a population cannot recover uh, and persist if its reproduction doesn't uh, allow the growth of the population um, and sort of outpace uh, mortality. Um, we have been declining at about a killer whale per year since 1995, which indicates a, a problem trend. We know that the number of reproductive females is going to decline even further uh, in the next decade because there are nine of these females that are going to age out of the reproductive age classes and only seven that are going to replace them. So if you think about it, we've got an entire population that's right now that's highly dependent on about 20 to 22 animals. And that means we're at grave risk from a number, number of different uh, risk factors. Thank you, Tim. Does anyone else want to just add on to what Tim said about the current population before we go to the next one? Donna, I think you need to unmute. If you... Thanks. I just wanted to weigh in since you mentioned Tahlequah. Tahlequah is the orca uh, two years ago who famously carried her, her dead calf grieving for 17 days. And we have a little bit of really good news. Tahlequah had a calf just a month ago. We've got a little baby boom going on. We've got two new calves in J-Pod and a few pregnant whales. So um, the orcas are trying, <laughs> you know, they're doing their best to recover. The question is, are we gonna create the conditions that allow that? 
Thank you. And I lost track of a whole year there. Sorry, I feel like everything's in such a blur right now. Um, yeah, yep, Chris. I would like to ask if it's fair for me to ask questions of the panel. <laughs> ask Tim, um, what is the typical calving rate for uh, reproductively active females? Can they calve once a year, once every two years? No, I don't think they calve that often. And I'd have to go back and check in the actual. A calving interval, but uh, but my guess is that it's closer to uh, somewhere between three and five years, depending upon upon uh, the health of the the individual female. Um, so that is a, an important question, pretty much because when a female has a calf, that calf isn't an assured member of the future population. It's got to survive over time, and uh, what we've seen in recent years is that. Uh, Calving survival, calf survival has been particularly poor. And in, this, in addition to that, the survival of older animals, animals that should otherwise be in the prime of their lives, has also not been great. So decreased reproduction, uh, decreased survival, as well as um, a limited reproduction. I think since 2015, there have been four calves born that are still alive. But it remains to see how well these two new calves that were just born will do. Uh, and we hope that, of course, that they will survive. One we know is a male, uh, the other, to my knowledge, we don't know yet. Is this considered a, an actual genetically distinct subpopulation? An accurate census? No, is this considered an actually distinct, genetically distinct population? And I'm sorry, Chris, I couldn't quite understand that. Is, is it a genetically distinct population is what Chris yes, is asking? Yes, it is considered a genetically distinct population. Good, thank you. So we hear um, a lot about these uh, Southern residents and their um, exclusivity for, for what they, they eat um, on Chinook and a lot of discussion about the lack of, um, of salmon availability. Um, we know there's efforts to uh, help restore salmon populations. Um, let's talk a little bit about how um, underwater noise impacts their ability to, to hunt those, those salmon that, that are there. We know there's not enough, but What's the impact of underwater noise from vessel traffic? I mean, that was directed at me. <laughs> uh, if you, yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is the um, one of the most critical unknowns, yet the critical question that we have right now. We do know that these animals, as as Tim eloquently just. Uh, described in the movie, uh, the documentary, they are highly dependent upon a naturally quiet uh, acoustic environment, or you might consider it actually an acoustic habitat for killer whales. <clears throat> because they, they forge, they communicate, they navigate using sounds, they know where they are. They, through passive listening, I'm quite certain that they have acoustic memories that uh, far surpass our own. So they know where they are just by listening to the noise from the ambient noise, waves on the rocks, waves on the bottom, reverberations, all that kind of stuff. Um, so what we're doing by um, invading that acoustic habitat with not with a toxin and not by stealing the fish, but by raising the background noise level is that we are in many ways dynamically and inexplicably for them changing the space, their acoustic space in which they live. It, it's the same you know, analogous to the phenomenon of us living in a cloud bank all the time where some days we might be able to see a couple hundred feet down the road and other times we wouldn't be able to see um, our hand in front of our face. And those, the, that loss of acoustic space and all the functions, bio, life functions that they engage in in that space are compromised. So 
the challenge scientifically is that if you're trying to find an answer to this very difficult question, okay, so what's the impact? What's the risk? Right now we have an experiment of one, an N of one on this population. And we know that as Tim described, we know it's not increasing. We know that the reproductive population is falling and has been falling. There's a difference between how many animals are in the Bedouin tribe, there might be 100 in the tribe, but maybe only 10 females are reproductively active. So your reproductive population is one tenth of the whole population. So that's, that's really, really critical. And the reason I asked you about the intercalving interval is that the intercalving interval, if it's long, that means your, the rate at which your population can increase is lower than it would be if it was a normal inter having rate. So when there are populations who are under stress because they can't find enough food, females can't have enough fat reserves to become go into estrus and, and then be disseminated, the calving rate may go up to five or six or seven years. And so this is where we're talking about, we have impacted the actual physiological, not, not even to mention the other health regimes of this population. And that's where noise, which comes from the aggregate of all the things we do, whether it's engine noise from little boats or lots of little boats or engine noise from super ships that are bringing all the stuff that we consume, all of that degrades their acoustic habitat and their acoustic lifestyles and reduces the chances of them being successful foraging, communicating, maintaining, maintaining social networks. That is unequivocally um, harmful to the population. Thank you. Ginny, could I just elaborate a little bit on yep. what Chris said? The National Research Council back in 2005 published a paper uh, or actually a small book and they put together the conceptual model for how sound affects marine mammals and it really sort of lays out what Chris just described. And we do have good science that says their behavior has been affected, their ability to hear, but their behavior has also been affected. That tends to mean that they are in poor condition. We have scientific evidence that demonstrates that. When they are in poor condition, that affects what we call those vital rates of reproduction and survival. And if those decline, then we've got a problem with population trend. That model, that conceptual model is a, really a perfect description of what we've seen here and the information we have on that is really good relative to so many populations. So I think there's a really clear case here that, that this is a problem. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just raise the point that in the film, there's a lot of um, references that are brought up and um, on screen while, uh, while there's talking going on and um, those, that list of references can be available to anybody who's watching. I think Kimberly is going to follow up with that list to make that available to folks who are, who are on, who had registered for this. Um, that's a lot, that's a, there's some great peer review literature there. I wanted to just raise the point of the um, ORCA task force. And, you know, there is a very long list of recommendations from that task force. And I, we don't have time to go through all of them, but Donna, you made the point in the film that regulating whale watching is, is, the, is one thing, one of the only things that can be done in a short term. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit Sure. Uh, thanks, Jenny. Yes, as, as a task force, uh, that was 44 people convened with three working groups, a vessel impacts working group, a prey working group, and a toxins working group. So you had all this tremendous gathering of minds and all these fields, fields looking at these impacts on the orcas. In the end, we came up with, I think, 44 recommendations across all three of those threats. The problem for the orcas is these threats all work together. When there's not an uh, orcas are the top predator in the sea and um, toxins bioaccumulate in their blubber. When they're stressed or hungry, those toxins may be released into their bloodstream and make them more susceptible to diseases that they might otherwise be resilient against. And of course, noise and disturbance 
makes it harder for them to find food and harder for them to rest and harder for them to communicate with each other, which may increase the release of toxins into their bloodstream. There's no one who thinks this is a one stop. So it, this is a complex problem with the multi-pronged solution. Yes, we need to increase salmon available to them. Yes, we need to reduce toxins going into the whole of the Salish Sea. And we need to reduce noise and disturbance so they have a better chance of seeing and finding what food is there. As Chris described, for the orcas, I think it's even hard for us to understand how important sound is. It's more than sound for us. It's a combination of sound, sound, seeing, and feeling. It's a multi-dimensional world they live in that is shaped by acoustics. So when we look at all those threats and all the things we need to do, the thing that leaps right out is what can we change right now that will help? And that's to reduce noise and disturbance around them. And the, there are many sources of noise. There's commercial, uh, commercial boats, there are tankers, there are ferries, there are uh, Navy, you know, Navy sonar exercises. We're concerned about all those things. And we do need to reduce and manage all those things for the orca's benefit. But there's one obvious sector, which is a commercial whale watching industry that has uh, grown exponentially during the exact same time that the orcas declined. The industry started growing a lot around 1996, which is when the orcas started dying younger and sooner than they should. There's not a direct cause, but you have to look at the trend. And the trend is that over the last decade, during the same period that the orcas declined, the number of whale watching boats more than doubled and their revenue tripled. They have a sophisticated sighting network. So they always know when the, when the whales come into the Salish Sea, the net result is that the whales don't take a breath in the Salish Sea during waking hours that there isn't a boat with them, a whale watching boat. Mm. And that in the summer, it, that the, our days are long here in the Pacific Northwest, as you know. So in the summer, that's nine o'clock in the morning till 1030 at night. And in the peak, whale watching peaked a couple of years ago in 2018, just so everyone understands how many boats we're talking about, most people are surprised to learn there were 130 boats in the Salish Sea, 130 commercial whale watching vessels possible to be on the water. Around every group of Southern residents, sometimes there was a peak of 35 commercial vessels, plus the recreational boats they attract. When you look at the scale and impact of whale watching, it's, it's, it's not surprise they're endangered, it's surprise they survived. <laughs> so one thing that seemed obvious to all of us is break, uh, give the whales the best chance to find what food is there and do that by curbing the impacts of an industry that is the only industry that targets them, that follows them intentionally. So I, we came up with two recommendations. One was to license this industry. One of the reasons it grew so fast is because it was unregulated. Anybody who had a commercial license could call themselves, could start taking out whale watching passengers. They could fish one day and whale watch the next. Um, uh, another, another thing we recommended was a moratorium. We all understood that putting together a licensing system would take a while. So uh, we recommended that there be no whale watching for three to five years by recreational or commercial vessels. So, the, and those were supported near unanimously by a diverse task force. The only people who, had, who, who didn't appreciate that were, were, was the industry representative themselves. Thank you, Donna. And I, I did yeah. just want to mention the fact that we um, that Mark uh, did invite uh, a couple of different representatives from the whale watching industry to participate in this panel discussion today, and um, they they weren't able to join us. So I um, apologize that, that they're not here. Um, we do have a question in the in the Q and A box for Sorrel, um, and I want a chance to bring you in, Sorrel. Um, how have you seen community involvement against whale watching change over time? Uh, let's see if I'm un unmuted here. Well, I've lived uh, on Lopez Island for 40 years and it's, uh, you know, in my opinion, an insane industry that's completely out of control. 
Uh, it's gone from the when I moved here in the early 80s. We didn't even consider whale watching as, as a thing people did, except for those of us who lived on shore and enjoyed the magic of watching the whale swim by. And I can say as a resident who lives here, who is the neighbors of the Southern residents, that this industry um, is making life miserable for those whales. And I have witnessed with my own eyes, as have most of my neighbors and friends, just some horrendous uh, activities out there on the water. We've seen herding, chasing, um, you know, any number of activities that very clearly interfere with these whales' ability to forage and communicate with one another. It's a zoo out there. It is the Salish Seaquarium. And as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, it's wrong. And um, I myself am not a fan of Jeff Friedman and Pacific Whale Watching Association. You know, they have spent tens of thousands of dollars in lobbying and lawsuits to reduce or eliminate protections for these whales, including the recommendations of the ORCA task force. Now you wanna compare this to the indigenous peoples, the Coast Salish peoples who lived in harmony with the ORCA for tens of thousands of years. They considered the ORCA their relatives, their ancestors. What we're seeing here is pure colonizer mentality. The idea that we have a right to exploit a critically endangered species for profit is morally and ethically wrong. It's shameful. And, I, and as we speak, while the licensing committee is taking comments, the whale watching industry is actively lobbying via organizations that directly profit from them to um, undermine the efforts of uh, people like those of us on the panel. They call us well-intentioned but ill-informed. Uh, <laughs> the former is true, the latter is completely false. You know, we're very informed. I consider Dr. Clark and Dr. Reagan unbelievably informed. These are scientists. And so I, what we're talking about here is just what we're talking about in the rest of the country. It's all about money. It's all about making money. And they are going to squeeze every last drop of money out of these endangered orcas that they can get. There's no justification for whale watching. Two recent science reports came out and said, there's no evidence of this sentinel protective effect that is the big talking point of PWWA. And there's no evidence that they're gonna lose money by not watching the whales. So why are they fighting so hard? One reason alone, it's a special thing. They can take people out on the boats and say, guess what? We're gonna go watch these critically endangered whales. I wouldn't doubt that the licensing committee commission uh, by giving them exclusive opportunities is gonna give them an opportunity to charge more for those little time slots. They can go see the endangered orcas. So to me, what we're seeing here is colonizer mentality, the idea that in the space of one century, we humans, we newcomers to this area have completely ruined the environment for these endangered orcas and they're almost extinct. So I, I think it's just shameful and it's morally wrong. So I wanna pick up on a couple of uh, topics that Sorrel brought up. One is the issue of um, enforcement. Um, another is the sentinel effect. Uh, third is the, ec the economics here. So um, let's let's talk about enforcement for a little bit. Uh, how much enforcement is happening right now, um, and why isn't there more? It sounds like there's not enough. Did that come up, Donna? The, yeah, yeah. I can I can jump into that. Yeah. Um, so enforcement is generally accomplished, or specifically accomplished, by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife enforcement marine patrols and the challenge is that season to they, season to season uh, their funding is not assured so they are there was one year i think 2015 where there were zero patrols there were no boats on the water no no patrol boats the other thing is that soundwatch soundwatch is a program of the whale museum 
that's like a citizen a guardian program that can warn voters or let, let voters know that the whales are around. They can't issue tickets, but they can encourage people to behave, follow the Be Whale Wise guidelines and re behave appropriately around the orcas. And SoundWatch data shows that the, the commercial industry and all voters are two to three times more likely to disobey guidelines unless enforcement is present. So that means that with recreational voters, probably they don't understand the guidelines. Uh, with commercial, boat, commercial operators, it's a different story because they do know the guidelines. But the fact is that they don't obey them generally unless enforcement is a presence. So enforcement presence is critical to protect the whales. When you talk about the sentinels, the actual sentinels in the Salish Sea are Department of Fish and Wildlife Enforcement vessels. And the single uh, one thing, one really important thing we can do, especially as Washingtonians, is encourage that marine patrols are well funded and funded year round. Just this morning, I, saw, I live in West Seattle and this time of year, the Southern residents come here following winter, uh, winter chum salmon runs. I saw J-Pod this morning, a mile from where I live, rounding Alki Point, you know, with two calves. There, happily, there weren't too many boats with them, but there also wasn't any enforcement vessel. Our goal is that every time the whales come into the Salish Sea, there's an enforcement vessel with them, making sure that distance guidelines are observed. So that's, does that answer that? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to um, go to the sentinel effect, which was um, came up in the film and is uh, clearly a a big part of the whale watching industry's argument for their their role, um, their beneficial role, and I wonder, um, Tim. I think you've you've talked to me a little bit about this role. Um, what's how much science is there um, to this sentinel effect? Well, you don't actually have to take my word for it. Uh, the National Washington Academy of Science uh, just convened a science panel to look at that question. And their conclusion was that there is no science that supports it. That doesn't rule out that there might be some sentinel effect on occasions, but what people have often contrasted that with is what's called a magnet effect, where uh, whereas in the sentinel effect, you might be trying to keep boats away from the whales, the magnet effect would be that if you're out there whale watching, that will be a natural draw for a lot of recreational boats. Where the balance of that lies and how it all works out, we don't know for sure. But I think there is uh, no scientific evidence that that, that uh, sentinel effect is more significant than that magnet effect, et cetera, um, and is sufficient to uh, eliminate or, or to uh, justify uh, the disturbance that is otherwise caused. Arguably, the problem here is that, yes, we want these whales protected um, from recreational boats, et cetera. Um, but, but as uh, Donna just mentioned, there are better ways to do that where the enforcers don't have an incentive to otherwise harass the animals. And that's what we're trying to get away from. You can do uh, patrols, you can do enforcement, um, but it does not have to be driven by uh, the, the industry itself. It should be driven by the enforcement agencies. And uh, Jimmy, I had one thing I wanted to add, kind of building on both those points, which is that um, as part of the licensing process that's currently underway in Washington, um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife commissioned an economic viability analysis. And it said conclu conclusively that the industry has built a thriving and viable industry watching other animals. Um, in the Salish Sea, we have humpbacks, we have gray whales, we have bigs or transient orcas, to the point that there is no reason, there's no economic need for any commercial operator to get close to the Southern residents. They have lost the economic argument how they defeated the moratorium in the legislature was they persuaded all the legislatures of two things that weren't true. They persuaded them that we wanted to shut down all whale watching. That is not true. We want them to leave the Southern residents alone. And second, they persuaded the legislatures that if they didn't watch the Southern residents, they would go out of business. That also is resoundingly not true. And now we have a report that says that. So it's not a coincidence that when that report came out, 
the industry stopped talking about their economic dependence on the whales and started repositioning and rebranding themselves as sentinels who must be on the water to protect the whales from recreational boats, which is patently ridiculous on the face of it. This is a commercial industry. That is why they're being licensed. No matter what bene benevolent other purpose they serve, their core purpose is commercial. They would like you to forget that. There is a, um, a question from the audience of, that says, if a complete moratorium was stopped, has there been consideration of moratoriums during other time periods, perhaps three to four days a week, particularly during key pro reproductive months? And that certainly speaks to the, um, the proposal, I believe, that is currently uh, coming from Department of Fish and Wildlife to regulate whale watching and um, can we talk about what that what's in that proposal right now? Cyril, do you have a, a read on that? You're muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, I think that Donna could probably speak better to the actual proposal, but the unfortunate part of what is being proposed is it's allowing whale watching during the peak from July through September. And in my way, I mean, there are many, I mean, the whales are feeding year round, but here in the San Juans, which is their core critical habitat, to have any whale watching during that time, just, uh, it doesn't make any sense. And again, as Donna pointed out, um, now that we know there's no sentinel effect, there's no financial incentive, supposedly, they're not gonna lose any money. So the question is, is why would this industry fight so hard? Why would they pay so much money? People, people don't pay you know, $100,000 to a lobbyist unless they're worried that they're gonna lose money or that they are worried about something else. So in my way of thinking, if you're gonna eliminate whale watching for a part of the year, um, you know, let them have a December, January and February, you know, to go out whale watching for two hours a day, not uh, July through September, which is the exact time when they're coming through the San Juans to, uh, to eat their Chinook. So uh, Jenny, let me just follow up specifically. So the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has proposed two options for rulemaking. One of the, one of the um, successes of the task force that then became law was this recommendation to license the commercial industry. That allows Fish and Wildlife to set rules for the number of boats, the hours and days they can be with the whales, and the areas and seasons they can operate. So right now, their public comment is being accepted on two options. Option A calls for a closure from no whale watching at all from October through June and limited whale watching July through September, four hours a day. The other option allows whale watching year round on weekends only during the shoulder seasons. And again, uh, for a certain number of days in the high summer season. I, I'd actually be interested in hearing what Chris or Tim think about the difference between a seasonal closure versus a day closure. To me, it seems it's very intuitive. The whales could be, be here any day of the week. There's no, they don't have a preference. So if you allow whale watching on a weekend, what the, what the proposal B says is the whales aren't protected unless they happen to come in on a weekday. We're, the whales are in a crisis situation. We've got all the reason in the world to give them the maximum protection with these new calves in the population. Why, why would we, for, for me, it's like saying, wear your mask five days a week. You're only better protected if you wear your mask every single day and every time you go out. That's the blanket protection the whales need. No matter what day they come in, we don't know. It could be one specific Saturday that whale watching has been allowed, that there's a run of salmon that they must have access to. We can't, the laws, the options don't make sense in terms of their, we, we strongly prefer option A because of the seasonal closure. And we'd like to see that seasonal closure extended year round. But I'd sure love to hear uh, Chris or Tim weigh in on the value of a closure by day rather than by season. Chris, thoughts? Well, it's, um, I'm not quite sure what the metaphor is or the analog is. Is it a 
uh, death by a thousand deafness. Um, you just, it, it makes absolutely no ecological sense to, I mean, uh, on, you could take that to the extreme and say, well, let's turn it off every other hour, um, which it, it just makes no sense to break it up at that, at that, that temporal scale. At least, uh, I would prefer to just have a complete moratorium for um, you know, a decade or something. Um, as, but if you're going to do it, then, then protect the season, which is the most critical season, and also make sure that you put buffer months on either side of it, because that season will have variability. So just because you read a paper and it says, well, from, you know, from March to May, that's the season. Well, as Tim will tell you, when we think as scientists that we have a pretty good idea biologically what's going on, it's a pretty fuzzy, right? We do our very best, but these animals are in a dynamic state, dynamic state relative to their population. So I would, I would add a month at least of a buffer zone on either side of whatever seasonal closure there is now being uh, offered. Maybe that would get it to six months or something. I, I totally agree with you. We must have to do everything we possibly can. And some of my suggestions would probably seem rather extreme, but we'll leave it at that right now. Tinny, one of the reasons we're concerned about this kind of choice is that when you are whale watching, the potential impact that you have can be immediate, i.e. you can disturb whales at that time in that spot, but it can also be prolonged. Um, so if you are regularly disturbing animals at the same spot, say off the west side of San Juan Island, um, and you do that season after season after season, you may find that those animals start to abandon that habitat. And what we see right now is that appears to be happening. Now, there are two different arguments for why that might be occurring. The industry is arguing that well, the problem is the salmon are decreased and they are going in different directions. Uh, but basically, a lot of the salmon runs have been so dissipated that, that they just aren't there. The alternative argument is that the animals have been so disturbed repeatedly there that they have determined that that habitat is no longer as high a quality as it might be. The problem we have is that we, we haven't really looked at those alternatives, but I actually think that both kinds of effects are reasonable. We've seen with other marine mammals that they will abandon uh, certain habitat, uh, foraging areas, resting areas, etc. There's no reason that these animals wouldn't be either. So it's a tough choice. I would, if I had to choose between option A and B, I think I would go with option A, but fundamentally, I don't think we should be disturbing them at all. We have to keep reminding ourselves, this is a highly endangered marine mammal population. We talk a lot about certain key risks, three of them up to this point, but this population is at risk from other factors such as a disease or uh, an oil spill or inbreeding depression, uh, alteration of their social uh, structure or even climate change. So we're on the edge, we have very little control of the future for this population, the thing we can control must, most are our own behaviors and our own actions. And that's what, why we think we should be holding off and, and backing away, giving them a chance to recover. Given that's the uncertainty a, Chris talked about. That's a, a good segue. I have uh, been asked to clarify um, the proposed rules limit whale watching of southern resident killer whales to certain seasons, days, and times. Whale watching of other species, such as humpbacks, would be allowed year round. Um, so that came from the audience. I know we have some folks from Fish and Wildlife on board, so that may have, might have come from them. Uh, we have several questions, and I know we're running short on time. Kimberly, I'm tracking, don't worry. Um, but there's some questions about other sorts of viewing, um, watching from uh, from kayaks paddling around. Um, and I wonder if somebody could speak to that. And also, Kimberly, I wonder if you could put up the whale trail slide just for a second so that people can see the land-based opportunities um, for viewing while I'm not sure who should talk about um, kayaking. Does anyone wanna take that one on? Well, I can, I can just, jump in and say that sure. uh, a 
uh, acoustic disturbance is, uh, we're not only concerned, disturbance includes actual physical disturbance. And uh, especially in the scale that kayaking occurs on the west side of San Juan Island, kayakers are also licensed, uh, will be licensed under this program, commercial kayaking companies. Just to give you a hint of, I mean, in, in 2016, more than 6,000 kayakers put in on the west side of San Juan Island, which is right in the heart of the Orca's critical range between uh, July and September. So it's a question of cumul daily and cumulative impacts. Every time we interrupt, every one of those kayakers could be changing the whale's behavior. When we change their behaviors, we make do anything that disrupts what they would be doing if we weren't there. That's a disturbance. And it all, as Chris said, it's by a thousand paper cuts. It all adds up. And uh, what you're seeing on the, on the, the screen here is a, as the whale trail. Um, happily, here around the Salish Sea and actually down the coast, we don't have to we don't have to give up whale watching if we give up whale watching from a boat. As I mentioned, I saw JPod from you know about a mile from my home here in West Seattle. The Salish Sea is ringed with locations that we've identified in the whale trail where you can see orcas or other marine mammals from shore. We started it just to build awareness about the southern residents when they became endangered, endangered where they lived. Over time, it's grown more strategic as, a con as an act of conservation to watch from shore. And the whale trail now, our original goal was to um, add whale trail sites around the southern resident Orca Range. That's as far north as mid Vancouver Island and as far south as Monterey Bay. So um, if you wanna watch whales from shore, go to our website and we'll, you can find lots of good places to do that. Great, thank you, Donna. And Kimberly, you can switch that off now. Um, we have had more questions, of course, than we can answer. Um, there was like a question. I just that there was, I see a question from a panelist saying, if you don't support the two uh, proposals from the licensing committee, what do you support? We support a year round suspension or closure of whale watching of the southern resident orcas until they are removed from the endangered species list. That's what we support, a year round suspension, closure of whale watching of the Southern resident orcas. There's nothing else that will provide them with the kind of protections they need, but a year round suspension and a one half nautical mile distance setback for, for, for all vessels. But in this case, the licensing committee is only authorized to deal with commercial whale watching vessels. Uh, yes. I was just going to say what Sorrel is advocating really is what you might call a precautionary approach. And people do need to understand what that is. And I'll yeah. give another example. Uh, Please, in sir. the late 1980s, uh, a lot of the North Atlantic longline fishing fleet moved out to the North Pacific. They had overfished their stocks. Uh, almost immediately, we started to see Hawaiian monk seals with hooks in their skin and in their lips and mouths and uh, with evidence that they had been bludgeoned. In that case, the National Marine Fishery Service and the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council got together and with a couple of years, they established what's called the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands uh, Protection Zone. That zone was 50 nautical miles on all sides of those islands, including the corridors between the islands. They took that action and almost instantly, we saw a decrease or a decline, the absence of really, of more animals being caught or hooked by that long line fishing fleet. So that was a big action. It was precautionary. It didn't say, let's wait and see what happens over the next few years. That was an endangered species, but probably with about 1,200 animals left. Here we have 74. Are we really going to wait? And to back up a little bit the risk, or to elaborate a little on the risk, we almost lost, or we're about to lose, the AT1 population of transient killer whales in Alaska. They have not reproduced since the 1980s, I think 1984. A number of them died, we think, from the Exxon Valdez spill. That spill itself really knocked that population out. They lost their reproductive capability. And there are right now the best estimate it is seven of them left, but they will not recover. That population is gonna go extinct. Uh, 
Um, and so in, the same thing could happen here. I'm sorry to cut you off. We, it's yep. 1.30 and I wish we could have gotten to every question, um, but thank you so much. Um, thanks panelists for a rich discussion and for the good questions that came from the audience. And I'll turn it over to Kimberly to sign us off. Can we do this again? <laughs> Yeah, it was a great discussion and a beautiful musical performance. Thank you all to our speakers for participating in today's event and many thanks to you as our audience for taking the time on this day to join us. Um, to le learn more about the film, check out the website ecosong.band. Later this week, all registered attendees are going to receive a follow-up message with information shared today within this panel, further citations from the film and today's webinar recording. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And again, thank you to our panelists, our speakers, and Ginny for moderating. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.